Smart gadgets are all around us, in televisions, in phones, in cameras, in cars, and also on our skin. Watches, bands, rings, earbuds, and even shirts can monitor the human body and can give insights into health and disease. These are the wearables. Wearables are spreading like wildfire. The global wearable technology market size was worth about 116 billion US dollars in 2021 and is predicted to grow to around 380 US billion dollars by 2028. Being on our skin 24 7, wearables can measure the pulse and can even tell the heart rhythm. How can these wearables help in the medical practice? How accurate are they in measuring heart rate and rhythm? Can physicians rely on them in the diagnosis and treatment of abnormal heart rhythms, known as arrhythmias? Recently, the European Heart Rhythm Association, ERA, released a practical guide on the use of digital devices to detect and manage arrhythmias. And we're here to review this valuable document in this episode and also in next week's episode. Hello and welcome. I'm Hussein Hishmat, Professor of Cardiology and Interventional Cardiologist, and welcome to this episode of CardioBuzz. In these two episodes, I will not focus on sophisticated medical devices such as halter monitors, implantable devices, defibrillators, pacemakers, life vests that can deliver therapy. Because these devices are med pure medical devices, they are well established, they are prescribed, implanted, and used by a physician. Instead, we will give an overview of the devices that are available for direct consumer purchase and can be used outside the hospital. In this week, we will give an overview of different device types and discuss which device is better for which situation, focusing on a patient who comes complaining of palpitation. Next week, we will discuss the clinical application of wearables in atrial fibrillation, in ventricular arrhythmia, in syncope, and the relevance and clinical applications for athletes. Digital devices for heart rhythm monitoring can be divided into two types based on the technology used, ECG and PPG. ECG is the electrocardiogram where we catch the electricity of the heart from the skin surface. PPG is photoplacismography. Forget about the long name. PPG depends on light. There is a light source and detector that can be used to measure changes in the blood volume from the surface of the skin. They detect the changes in the reflected light intensity and they use that change to generate a peripheral pulse waveform. The general rule is that the ECG-based devices are more accurate, but they need a conscious and educated individual to start an ECG recording, and they may also need some training. Whereas the PPG devices are less accurate, but they are cheaper, easier to use, and do not need a conscious educated patient to start the recording, PPG devices are usually working non-stop in the background. Let's start by the ECG-based devices. This is what doing a standard EKG or ECG looked like 140 years ago. Now, of course, it's much easier, but the patient still has to go to a healthcare facility, expose the chest, arms. The nurse has to connect 10 electrodes, 6 on the chest and 4 on the limbs to get the classic 12-lead recording. ECG-based devices can overcome this limitation by being handy with the individual at home. And there are three ways to get an ECG at home, a device or a patch or a smartwatch. We'll start first by the handheld ECG. These are dedicated small devices that are very portable. They can be given to someone at home and they increase the probability of recording the patient's symptoms once they occur. A handheld device can record up to six leads of ECG by applying an electrode to the left leg on a wet trouser while the individual is holding the device with both the right and left hands. The device may take 30 seconds to register. The ECG is recorded on the mobile application and can be shared to the healthcare provider. Of course, a clinician oversight is still required for the diagnosis. These are the handheld ECGs and there are several brands of them. The second type is the ECG patches. These are wireless, water-resistant, self-adhesive patches. They are easy to use and they are well-tolerated. They can stay on the skin from 5 up to 30 days 
and they have a high accuracy and a diagnostic yield that is even better than the medical halter monitoring devices. They are cost-effective and they can detect clinically significant arrhythmia within the first week of monitoring. The only limitation of these patches is that they have a relatively short battery life and sometimes the adhesive is not durable and they may fall off the chest. The third type is the smartwatches, of course readily available. Several smartwatches in the market can record a single lead 30 second ECG tracing by electrodes that are incorporated on the back of the watch and on the watch crown or case. The ECG can be recorded once the person feels the symptoms and can be sent to the treating doctor. One limitation of these devices is that they require charging so they will not be on the skin 24-7. However, there are some hybrid analog watches that can have a battery life for several days. Again, the generated ECG tracings need to be activated by the patient and confirmed by a physician. PPG types or the photoplicitography again utilizes a light source and a detector to reflect the changes from the blood volume from the skin surface. It's used in the clinical routines to measure the oxygen saturation and the pulse rate. The relative ease of this technology has allowed its incorporation into various wearable devices to analyze the heart rate and rhythm, such as the bands, the chest strap, the smart watches, the forearm bands, the rings, and even the earbuds. Photoplicitmography recordings are useful in someone who's symptomatic, but with very low probability of symptoms being caused by genuine arrhythmia. Here they can document a normal rhythm and a normal heart rate and we use them as a way to reassure the patient. Any arrhythmia that's detected using the PPG recordings should be confirmed by an ECG-based device if possible. So how to use these devices in the evaluation of palpitation? Patients may come complaining of transient palpitation and disturbance of the heartbeats that are too brief and they disappear before they visit their doctor or even before they reach the emergency. Some of these arrhythmia can be very benign, while others may be dangerous and may not be diagnosed until late after causing catastrophes. Examples of these arrhythmia are atrial fibrillation and ventricular arrhythmia. How can we utilize these devices in the situation where someone complains of palpitation, but everything is normal at the doctor's office? The ERA guidelines have a very nice algorithm for this common scenario. So we start here by someone who's complaining of palpitation, feeling his heart beats, feeling that his heart is rapid or his heart is slow. These are symptomatic palpitation. We have two ways of screening, as we said. We have an ECG-based device or a PPG-based device. And the ECG-based devices are preferable because they are more accurate. We tell the patient to use the ECG device or the smartwatch, or we give him the patch, and then the patient can start the ECG recording once he feels the symptoms. If we find an arrhythmia, then we reach a diagnosis. If there are no arrhythmia during the time that the patient claimed that he has symptoms, then the patient can be reassured. If ECG-based devices are not available, then we can go for PPG-based devices. The PPG-based devices are monitoring all the time in the background, and we can look at the log of these devices. If the patient complained at a specific time, we check the PPG that showed a normal heart rate and rhythm, then there's no abnormality and we can reassure the patient. If the PPG device showed an abnormal heart rate or an abnormal heart rhythm, then we need to confirm that using an ECG-based device. So which device should we choose for the patient? The answer for that question depends on the frequency of the symptoms, whether the symptoms occur on daily basis or on weekly basis or monthly or even every year. So for someone who has daily symptoms, he has daily palpitation, then a Holter monitor can be a good option. The ECG patch is usually not needed. An ECG-based device can be a good option. A PPG-based device is less accurate but can still be used. If the patient gets symptoms weekly, an ECG patch is a very good option here because it can stay for several weeks. A single lead ECG is also a good option but it needs to be activated by the patient whereas the ECG patch does not need to be activated by the patient. A PPG device is also a reasonable option. It comes as a second option because of the limited accuracy. 
I'd like to remind you that PPG devices include the fitness bands, smartwatches, rings, and earbuds. If the patient gets symptoms monthly, then Holter Monitor will definitely not be the preferred option. An ECG patch, again, is a very good option. And the ECG portable devices, again, are also good options. PPGs come next. For someone who has very rare symptoms that occur, for example, every year, here the Holter Monitor, of course, will not work. The ECG patch will not be sufficient because it does not record for an entire year. Whereas an ECG portable device can be good and can be activated by the patient once he gets the symptoms. PPG based devices always come as a second option. And of course there is a medical device which is the implantable loop recorder which is implanted underneath the skin and can stay with the patient for one year. That was all for this week's episode. Please share your comments on which device do you prefer for your patient or family. Please subscribe and activate the bell to get notification. And stay tuned for next week's episode. We will discuss the second part of this review on atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmia, syncope, and athletes. Cardio Buzz is your weekly show for cardiology news, reviews, conference coverage, and interviews with experts.